Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Glenn Gentile, Director and CEO of the Orlando Museum of Art. Glenn has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Glenn, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. So you have a jewel of a museum, right, adjacent to, to a park here in Orlando. Talk about your philosophy of presenting art to the citizens of Orlando and, and its visitors. That's a large question and a very specific question from my perspective because a lot of it deals with a trajectory that connects to something I experienced many years ago. But along the way throughout my career path, I've found that I have constantly been talking with people about artists, the people who produced the things that we exist within. When I say artist, I'm talking about literally visual artists, architects, musicians, poets, writers, people who are in the fashion industry, people who are designing the interiors, the people who create a good part of what we exist in on a daily basis and take for granted. That to me is part of what I am trying to channel through my work as a director, formerly as a curator, registrar, all the way down to somebody who initially started out sweeping floors and working his way up, but connecting with the the creators and something Sharon Loudon uh, recently put out, it's a new book, uh, Culture Producer, you know, artist as culture producer. That in its, in, 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 as a network begins to deliver the vision and the perspective that this industry contributes significantly to the creative economy of a city, of a region, and of the United States. And I think every director in this country would agree with me that it's significant, but oftentimes overlooked. So trying to educate people to connect them to art and new ideas and ways of thinking about the world and the society we live in is what my philosophy is really about. And so you are presenting those ideas in physical form within a particular context. You allow people to walk into your doors, to now be immersed in these ideas, sometimes walking through the ideas themselves. How do you select the ideas that you will present at the museum? For us, it's about piecing together, connecting the dots in a way that brings a unified vision to a group or collective perspective utilizing the abilities of the people around me and my own so that we can create something larger than just what one person can do. Uh, as the director, I am, uh, as I said, a servant leader. I believe in trying to work with the people around me and help people and make other people's lives better. Uh, and uh, in my small way, I'm a museum director. I'm not going to change the entire world. I know it. but. I'm going to do whatever I can to make a difference and with the people around me to help them make a difference. Our circles of influence ind individually may be small, may be significant, but collectively they begin to overlap and resonate like the gears of a watch or a, a, a machine of some sort and then the engine is moving. And that's what I, I, I like to, to see happen. So overlap, absolutely, but people respect each other's individual areas and work together collaboratively. And I think that's uh, an asset for my organization. Discuss your exhibition schedule, for, for example, in the last year and then going into the future. So there are five new exhibitions each year and then a rotating schedule of about seven permanent collections that change on a monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly basis. The nature of the organization, uh, the Orlando Museum of Art, is it has uh, a, a historical collection has uh, works that are you know, early American. It has contemporary uh, a, a collection, which is probably the larger, most active part of the collection of the museum. But we have African art as well, and we also have a, a very fine collection of uh, ancient America. Each has a real purpose for the institution, uh, but ultimately, the, the, the force, I think, in magnetism is providing a modulation that connects with a variety of different communities within Greater Orlando. You know, you talk about diversity, uh, people have different interests, people come from different backgrounds, and people want to connect for whatever reason with an experience that may be different from what I happen to like best, but I have the opportunity to formulate and mold what I have available to me in a way that may interest you, Mark, and may provide you and your friends or family with an experience that 
they wouldn't find somewhere else. And that is what we're trying to do. I think that's what we deliver on. We have a 92-year history right now. We were founded in 1924. And in 1924 until 1960, we were a fledgling organization. Our fr I'm the third director of the Orlando Museum of Art in its 92-year history. And that's because the first director was hired in 1959-1960. Since then, there's been uh, David Rees, Marina Grant Morrissey, and myself. Uh, and looking back and you know, taking stock of our past and then looking at the present moment that we can be justifiably proud of, but then looking forward to the future and saying, where do we want to be when we turn 100 as a 21st century institution in the, one of the fastest growing cities in the state of Florida, one of the largest states in the Union, uh, in the United States of America? What does this institution want to be in the 21st century, and not just for 10 years from now, but for 50 years from now. How are we going to position ourselves and how are we going to harness the support and the energy to create that vision? And that vision is a forward to 100 vision, which is our 100th anniversary. When you work with living artists, are you are they developing site-specific installations or are they presenting their, their past works in, in, in your museum? It's a combination, Mark. Um, you know, I love installation art. I love the way that, you know, the, the process of working with artists in the moment, trying to figure out exactly how something's going to come together. But largely, we run the, the, the spectrum. Whether you are a painter, a printmaker, a sculptor, or an installation artist, we haven't done a whole lot with the artist's body. And that's more performative in many ways, right. uh, but it's an area that I think it's worth exploring for the institution, but in due course. And how do you connect your education programming and your public programming to your exhibitions? Part of it is looking at uh, the, the community we try to serve to the best of our ability. So one area that I'm very interested in and members of my board and the education team is very interested in, of course, is reaching youth. Uh, having uh, children have the opportunity to experience art in a museum in their city and have an experience with an original work of art face to face uh, while also augmenting that with digital applications that they may have through school and so forth. But a one-on-one -on -one or group experience with a unique work of art in person I think, think is extremely uh, relevant for young people, and the idea is to plant those seeds, as you've heard many times before, so maybe they carry that throughout the rest of their lives, or it, it kind of percolates as they continue to grow. But, but reaching also out to senior citizens, um, we try to find avenues that we can connect with individuals at different places in their lives. Uh, individuals with uh, cognitive dis disorders, early onset Alzheimer's, uh, individuals who uh, are in high school that are considering where to go. It's a very, very uh, sensitive time for those uh, young people. And just knowing that there's an option uh, to, to consider and have a, a positive experience with, I think, goes a long way. What works are very representative of your collection? Through the lens of the Friends of American Art up to 1945, uh, there are a, a fair number of works that are quite wonderful, but one piece that a lot of our, um, our visitors tend to respond to is a, a, a landscape of a train moving through a uh, winter scene. Uh, and it's by Leon Kroll, and it's not huge. It has uh, an intimacy about it that people are attracted to, and they can understand the story and kind of conjure their own ideas about what is happening in the painting. And I match that against something that uh, the Friends of uh, the Acquisition Trust has collected, a, a, a recent acquisition within the last three, four years, uh, a sound suit by Nick Cave. And it is, in my opinion, one of the great sound suits, and all of his sound suits are so great, so it's hard to really say that, but I'm, I'm, uh, uh, it's mine, right? So, <laughs> but the idea of people think about what is going on with this sound suit on a mannequin, looks like I'm supposed to be in there wearing it, and there is all of the, there are all these things flying around the head, 
it's a universe occurring, and so they construct a story as well. Two very different experiences, two very different approaches to creating, but engaging the viewer, you find that there is a similar connective tissue within those experiences. And that always, for me, is a pinpoint that I like to kind of the launch pad, that I like to move forward through education, my philosophy about how I try to deliver in my own service as a director. Is the connective tissue, in certain respects, the audience itself and how the audience responds quietly, thoughtfully, engaged, excited, jumping out of their skins, thinking I should be in that scene or that suit? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, it's more than that as well. But when, you, when, when that resonant moment happens, the voice of the artist has entered the mind of the viewer. And there is a dialogue that occurs, whether it's fleeting or whether it's contemplative for five minutes or a half hour. That moment, short or extended, protracted, is a critical part of what we do in our, in our practice in, in the museum field. Uh, so I feel pretty lucky when I get to see that, when I get to experience it. But we all know there is that we're one part of the larger machinery that is happening. And taking what we do seriously uh, in a world that is distracted by so many things uh, to kind of maintain uh, the, the gumption, maintain the excitement, the passion, the desire, uh, and the people around you to not be distracted, to deliver the goods as it relates to what art and culture can do for a country, what it does for a city and what it does for an individual uh, is critical in my perspective. And your job in part is to get out of the way of that communication between the artist and the viewer, and in part to contextualize that and to present it in a way that can be absorbed by the viewer. Perfectly said. You know, it's being very diplomatic in many ways. You know, having respect for the artist, for the viewer, finding avenues of communication and encouraging that dialogue. I'm interested in intellectual discourse. I'm interested in what people have to bring to the table. And my institution is as well. Because everybody tends to think about like art, or many people do, especially, you know, in the general public as everything's touchy-feely. But it isn't. Art has a real edge and force and magnetism to it. That is what attracted me to the field to begin with. And it was an experience with a work of art by Picasso that was actually in the newspaper. It was uh, Guernica, and it was reproduced in a newspaper. And it, since it's a black and white and gray painting, it produced very nicely. And as a young kid, I remember seeing it and understanding something about it. It had impact. So, of course, I made an effort to go see the actual piece at MoMA and managed to do that. I knew there was an edge to art and there was a force and magnetism. We talk about 1945, you know, when the art world shifts from Paris to New York. You know, the artists who were creating then had power and force and magnetism. And today I see the same thing in a very different way sometimes, but it's there and it's important. And I like people to uh, understand that, you know, Van Gogh everybody loves, and, and that's just one example. I happen to love Van Gogh as well. When the works were created, they were outrageous, blasphemous. You know, they 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 create they created a stir. But the reality is, you can no hang technique, that in, right? No, no technique. technique, but you can hang that in, in you know in in your grandmother's bedroom, and she would love it now. So things change over time, uh, and I, I just I, I like to kind of just consider that for myself because it's very ordinary, but there's something very extraordinary about that. Glenn Gentile, thank yeah. you so much for sharing the work of the Orlando Museum of Art, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark. It's a real pleasure. Thank you.